But the goal was always to play for Otago. And it took me um, three or four years in the academy when the other mates were like getting contracts, other people were getting in, they were bringing in people from other regions to take my position. So like four years in a row, got the hard no. So Rugby Brick started as content only. So for two years, I put out coaching content for free with maybe I might make a kicking tee. I was watching all these pages on social media that were just wicked golf tips and wicked basketball tips. They were all targeted at the level sort of above amateur. Like the content was so boring. Hi, I'm Dan Carter. Here's the three <laughs> ways to like, right, come on. I was lucky enough to have Tony Brown for four years. And man, Brownie would say one thing and I'd be thinking about that little cue or advice for like the next two weeks. Hey team, uh, just a quick one here. Unfortunately, the first 60 seconds of our podcast didn't record on our recording device, uh, which is a wee bit unfortunate. So what we're going to do is we're going to skip forward 60 seconds. Peter just starts talking about his early days of rugby with North Otago. Hopefully you guys enjoy the podcast. Give us a follow if you haven't, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Craft, reps, muscle memory, all those things were in me and then I just brought that to rugby and sort of found the benefit of that in myself from those other experiences. So did you get into rugby quite late or? Yeah, so I was 17 when I first started playing, so got, wow. thr- got thrown in, um, oh it might have been a little bit earlier than that, yeah 15 and just chucked straight into the midfield. I was quite a big kid, so I dominated people physically (laughs) first. Um, And so that was a benefit for me, I loved it. But um, yeah, I I found like I got to it later than a lot of other kids at school. Yeah, because I was having a uh, researching and did you start, did you start with uh, North Otago when you were like 17, 18 years old? Yeah, so played one season and then Glenn Moore, the head coach. um, Yes. Again, I was a big kid, so I didn't look out of place, but I definitely probably wasn't ready for the opportunity. Chucked on the wing, got a cap at 16 for North Otago. So, All right. yeah, was was scared. That was second division back when North Otago was, was a big deal. Yeah, they were. They were a very big deal back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> so intimidating, but got the cap. Yeah, and then um, from there you, you, you branched into the, the Otago setup. Uh, what was that like for you at that time? Because obviously you would have been a little bit older. Um, yeah, tell us about how it was, life was like for Otago. I guess was, this was 2011, 2012 that you sort of got on there? Yeah, there was a hard graft. So I decided I'm going to chase rugby. Got invited to the Otago Rugby Academy. Came down here, played club rugby, age group stuff. But the goal was always to play for Otago. And it took me... Um, three or four years in the academy when the other mates were like getting contracts, other people were getting in, they were bringing in people from other regions to take my position. So like four years in a row, got the hard no, like the call that's pretty devastating because like it's a big deal when you're chasing a goal. Like your goal is basically your world at that time and it definitely was for me. So had to stay hungry, had to take those knocks and stay in the craft and um Probably that last year before I made it was when I made a big shift with my goal kicking and skills game to get as good as or better than other players and managed to get selected off the back of that yeah. season. Well, was that like a like a conscious thing that you decided I'll specialise in this or was that somebody giving you some feedback to go, this is the way to crack it? Yeah, there's a player called Hayden Parker who was a gun goal kicker, one of the best kickers um, New Zealand's probably created uh, across Super Rugby and... He was he was trumping me at that, and his his passing game and skill set was probably a little bit better. So, I just wanted that to not be an excuse. So, I wanted to be as good as as Cosy as Hayden, and also um, yeah, be ready with that so that I knew that I could perform that for the team and I can bring a couple of other things as well. So, when I made that shift, it was it sort of gave me a north star to really go towards, whereas I was probably trying to be good at everything, rather than just having a, a superpower. Take us back to um, those those three or four years where you were getting the hard no, um, how did you stay determined and, and, and on the right track to, to know that, well, let's keep putting in the hard yards and I'll definitely get my spot in the Otago team? Yeah, it was hard because there was other options. There's, uh, they sort of call it the invisible crossroads where just different things come up and go chase that, go try something else. But 
I knew what the goal was and I just knew that if I was patient and waited a few people out that I'd eventually get an opportunity. And looking back now, I think that's one thing that I'm really proud of is, is in those times I've always left no stone, stone unturned, like if I'm chasing it, um, yes, yeah, stay in the fight. Mm. And then when you did get your, you know, the call to be in that Otago team, what did that feel like for you? Was it a sense of accomplishment? Did, did you feel like that you, that you managed to... Um, you know, secure the dream and, and yeah, what did that sort of feel like for you? Well, the most rewarding thing, um, and it's happening a lot now, is that you get to go full time. So now your gym sessions aren't 6 a.m. till 7 a.m. <laughs> get out of the gym, other teams coming in, like get. Now you've got like a 9.30 a.m. gym session <laughs> and then like a midday meeting and home by sort of four o'clock. And that was the real fun part. And I guess why all our academy boys really wanted to get a contract because then for six months sweet we've got this like <laughs> bizarre life where we can have coffees and full-time rugby players so that was such a cool reward because yeah. I was hustling I was personal training I was at the gym I was trying to do house renos you're trying to just make a rugby and world and pay rent life work and then you get this awesome reward um, and then once you're in it you're sort of playing rugby every week and um, preparing for games which is really fun Yep, and then, yeah, as you said, you're, you're on the grind for for, for a long um, period of time there, and you almost cracked the Highlanders, correct? Yeah, almost, never got a cap in Super Rugby right. um, in the Highlanders region or up north when I was with Northland. Mm. Um, that was another hard one to take. When I went up north, I was probably closer to making the Blues debut than, de- than down here. There's some awesome tens, Hayden, Lima Sopawanga, Marty Banks was around, so there was already three yeah. quality tens down here. Went up to Northland, and one thing that I'm super proud of is the year that I almost sort of got my opportunity, I was in the Blues wider training squad, was about to get picked, I was bracketed, um, but I was ready, I was yep. fit enough, I was skillful enough, my kicking game was good enough. I was ready to perform, so it's something that I can really live with because I'm, I'm super proud of I was good to go. Yep. And I can definitely say that I was, I was ready for that. Because there's a lot to be said about, so we had uh, Jenny Armstrong on here and she's um, a sailor mm. and timing has everything to do with, what, as well as uh, preparation and all that type of stuff, but essentially it can come down to timing. You know, there's, there's two really good people or players or, or you know yep. opportunities that come up and only one gets it because of you know the, the timing whatever the timing is so it is interesting to hear you say that you, you know because um, I think there comes a little bit of peace with that as well How you know we, we understand shit man this is, a, this is as good as I get yeah. and if I'm still not good enough then it's more than likely down to some sort of you know timing or, or, or opportunities that come yeah. up or don't and I think you'll always be proud of the effort and, correct and I'm, I'm super proud um, and also with that timing it's, it's also one person's opinion so that's one coach making a decision on a player. So uh, at the time it doesn't feel like that, but in reflection you can be yeah super proud of the effort. Yeah, yeah. yeah I guess at the time, like a few years down the track as well, you um, you already had your nose. You know, you already had your mm. haven't made the team, haven't made the team. By that point, you didn't get your, your cap, but it sounded like you were at peace of the fact that I was ready. I was ready to go out there, but it just wasn't my time. Yep, and I think your peers really respect that as well. Like playing a lot of uh, provincial rugby like you're playing the same people like they're in that same those mm. same games as all blacks in provincial rugby we had a wicked time with sort of players like Tommy Allison and Ben Smith for us mm. um, Fumiaki Tanaka from Japan so you you gain respect from people that way as well so now when I'm still bumping into those circles like there is that mutual respect of um, you acknowledge each other's hard work and mm. um, that goes a long way anything you're dirty about then <laughs> um, I mean I would have loved to have played more I think um, I would have liked to set myself up a little bit earlier to understand remember about that taking four years in the academy to finally get an opportunity I think um, I would have maybe done that phase a little bit different I definitely didn't swing the bat enough when it comes to taking the big shot like I would have loved to have been a little bit more fearless and tried more things because I think that that really um, sets you up for success but it's also something that people want to have in their teams is that the guy the person yep. who's willing to take the risk so I was pretty safe and sound those early years yep 
And while you were playing those last sort of few years of professional rugby, what were you sort of doing behind the scenes to sort of set you up? And I know that we're going to talk about rugby Brexit um, shortly, but to get you yourself into that position, were you always thinking strategically, like, right, what is my next move? Personal training was my work and then also house renovation. So throughout my career, that's how I sort of made money and, and was able to pay rent and, and live. Learned a lot through personal training. Um, blast from the past, like this goes full circle. So back mm. at World Gym here in Dunedin and um, and then taking that over to Melbourne and the connections, the the rapport building skills that you get, the coaching uh, has gone a long way because you're working with people from all walks of life, different goals, motivation, all those things was... I didn't know that Rugby Ricks was going to be the end result of all that stuff, but I fully believe that whatever you're doing, you take that skill set into the next thing, and that's how I've always thought about it. Is, is I always work in project world. I, I really don't like the question of what do you want to be when you grow up. Mm. I love, like, what's the current project you're building and working on, taking that skill set and, and applying it to whatever is next. So when you were playing, like, where did the idea of Rugby Bricks sort of come from? Because... It's just a kicking tee. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 what you know from from the outside looking, and obviously there's there's a, there's a lot of science and and whatever behind it. But it's just a kicking tee, and it seems like you were the first to sort of make a kicking tee, uh, you know, look and <laughs> look yeah. good and, and and sell the product really well. Because mm. I mean, I remember when I was playing rugby, you just go down to Rebel Sport, you grab yourself a kicking tee, and, and that's it. Um, but you've you've turned it into something that's obviously now it's more than just a kicking tee. You've got a wide range of things that you do. Yeah. It's in demand yeah, as well. Yeah, hey. yeah, yeah, it's in demand. You've made it a thing, and I know there's a lot of people involved in it as well. But how did that come about? Like, were you just playing rugby one day, ready to kick a conversion, and go, oh, fuck, I need to make new, a kicking tee? Kick <laughs> the um, the kicking tee came afterwards. So Rugby Brick started as content only. So for two years I put out coaching content for free with maybe I might make a kicking tee. Um, okay. So that's how it started. And the reason I started the content was, going back to my background of basketball and cricket, I was watching all these pages on social media that were just wicked golf tips and mm. wicked basketball tips. They were all targeted at the level sort of above amateur Whereas what I saw in rugby was it's like, it's all the junior stuff. Here's the three basic things of how to make a tackle. And it was slow. Like the content was so boring. Hi, I'm Dan Carter. Here's the three <laughs> ways to like, right, come on. So I saw that there was a big hole. So I wanted to jump into that and, and sort of see if I could do what I was seeing in basketball and cricket and rugby, because no one was. So leant into that. Um, I think if you don't look back on your first pieces of, con of content and embarrassed by it, you probably started too late. <laughs> exactly the same. Like, when I look at some of that old stuff, why are we? Um, but that was the vision. And then so we built an audience, probably got it to around 40,000 followers. And then um, I, I wanted to have a kicking tee and then built the first kicking tee from there with that already established audience that we already knew what I was about. Mm. It kind of makes sense. It's not really a question, but listening to you already is like the detail and, and all that sort of stuff and growing up and having that kind of ingrained in you very much sounds like rugby bricks mm. you know you take a very very simple skill that looks simple but then when you break it down there's a lot of complication in there yeah. and then just to repetitively repeat it because a lot of the a lot of the content that I see is exactly the same but it's just tailored in a slightly different way for sure and it is it yeah. is taking that same formula from other things um also, my, t my talking voice, I definitely am aware of how I speak when I'm this rugby bricks person or person on screen. And um, I watch things around comedians or um, public speakers and how they use their language and visual cues to get points across. Make a point. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's amazing how many things us humans say that are just time wasters. Yep. So today I'm going to talk about the drop kick. When we drop kick, like you've just told me twice the exact same thing. Yep. Yep. So there's yes. little things like that happening that I've definitely loved the craft of. One thing I'm really proud of with Rugby Bricks is it's almost a green light to become obsessed and to work hard. So yeah. our mantra is out, work, out, learn. It's sort of like our Nike, just do it. And when I look back on the people that are around me that I loved, is they almost gave you a bit of a green light to be obsessed, to be a hard out. 
because shit, there's a lot of people telling you not to. Yeah. There's a lot of nah, nah just stay on the couch. You're yeah. all good. Just watch a movie and. Um, so I wanted rugby bricks to be a bit of a green light. You can train your skills every day. You can kick every day. You can get out there and outwork people. So I'm really proud of of being able to do that for people. Yeah, awesome. The early stages of, of rugby bricks. Did you did you want to to make a living out of it at the start, or was it just more of a hobby sort of thing for you? I didn't think I could. <laughs> so when Kale Panaho turned up into the business and um, awesome member here at the gym and just a good, great human, and he's sort of my um, yin and yang. Mm. So we complement each other so well. He thinks about the world differently than what I do. And when he brought up sort of three years in, like, I reckon you can go full time in two months. I was, didn't believe him. I was like, how would that ever happen? Like, that's not how, that's not what's been happening. How the hell would we ever do that? Um, and so, yeah, it wasn't the vision, but it's exactly where I kind of wanted to get to. And as soon as we had that, he's a great planner and deep thinker and forecaster. Um, we were able to make that successful and then I was able to understand um, what my actions could be to make that happen for the next year and compound from there. So, yeah, it was, we're such a, good, such a good team and we bounce off, off each other so well. Mm, awesome. You, you've managed to get to a point now, um, obviously you've got a lot of the programs that you guys do as well and then you've got a wide range of rugby athletes that are on board um, with the likes of of Aaron Smith and Will Jordan and Antoine Dupont, all those types of guys. Um, How how have those guys benefited your brand and your business by having these world-class players represent your brand? Yeah, I sort of call it the Steph Curry rule. So whenever we see a pro athlete doing something, whether it's Tiger taking a tee shot, or Steph Curry just shooting at training. People watch, it's, it's attention, it's interesting. It's the world's best doing something, so it's it's already got that um, attention factor to it. So as soon as, um, Aaron was one of the first guys to really help me out with being being able to bring that, because man, if Aaron's doing it, probably it must be the right way. It's probably important. <laughs> yeah. And so it gives it that big time credibility. So yeah, I've always been massively thankful to those guys um, for just being on camera and then whatever they share is a massive bonus because it just yeah, it brings so much credi- credibility to it. Yeah, so you, are you always looking at um, different rugby players and, and see if they can add value within your business or is it just this guy is, you know, like an Aaron Smith, the best halfback in the world, we're gonna, we're gonna get him on board? Most of them have become about a little bit more organically. Um, and that's the beauty of socials is that you can see someone liking your mm. stuff. So if, uh, there's been quite a few people like Will Jordan just liked a few, saw that I was in Christchurch, hey bro, would love to have a session. Yeah. And so from there, um, the trade-off is, well, you don't have to pay me anything, but I'd love to film and capture some, some content. And that's happened multiple times over the years, um, which has been, yeah, massive, beneficial. Yeah. So kind of like your playing career you kind of get to a level and you're like well you know I haven't quite been able to go to the next level but I'm okay because I've worked the best I possibly can um, any from a business point of view anything that's kind of like oh man this is a big barrier I don't know if we can get over this like was COVID a thing for you? COVID was it was it was hard rugby shut down but we also benefited as well because okay what a an, what a great opportunity to work on your game yeah um there has been some financial pressures that have come on that through that period, I think myself and KP's main thing was to keep Rugby Bricks alive. So we just have to get through it and then there's something about a brand staying alive for a certain number of years that just builds even more credibility. So when Rugby Bricks is 10 years old, these guys have been at it for a while, they always deliver, they keep showing up daily. So that was a big part of that. Like we we made the hard decision, young family and turning up and we decided not to pay ourselves for four months. So that was tough. Um, and that makes hard conversations and <laughs> frustrations and um, yeah, there was some interesting times through that. Uh, and then you solve problems out another way. But I've always been really thankful to KP for being in it with me and like being in the boat and being in the hardship and we'll get through it together. Uh, it's been it's been cool. Did you have to focus on your content a lot more during that period of time? 
I saw it as a gift because yeah. I've got more time now yeah. and you can just go and do this and like that's where I've probably done some of my best work built some of the best programs because I could just be obsessed there was no other things there was, yeah. wasn't weddings birthday parties distractions yeah. um, and I've enjoyed it I, I am introverted I love my own stuff and I love working hard and putting my head down so um, I yeah, gained a lot through COVID it was awesome mm. you guys only uh, are, me- are you just manufacturing the teas here in New Dunedin. Zealand and Dunedin? progressive yeah yeah it's Dunedin Alan plastics. Mosgill JTEC Plastics so that's um, it's been a big part of the brand story and yeah, New, awesome. Zeal- New Zealand rugby is New Zealand rugby we get looked at so differently you only have to do a little bit of travel to see that and feel that so now there's this dude on socials with a heavy Kiwi accent, um, which we don't really hear, but we do have pretty heavy yeah. Kiwi accents. And then there's a product coming from New Zealand that's targeted at like the top shelf. Like we're, we are the most expensive tea on the market, yeah. but then we put in our workout, learn mantra behind it. We put content behind it. If you use this tea, it's basically saying you're about this life and, and all the yeah. rest of it. So yeah, we're proud to have it made out in JTEC and, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big strength for us. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, because I saw, um, I mean, I've, I think I'll follow Kale on, on LinkedIn, or I may have seen it from you as well, around um, that staying in Dunedin is, is, is true to your brand, um, even though it is a lot cheaper for you to do it mm. uh, elsewhere. Yep, and because it, it adds to brand story, that's where the power comes from. Um, I've done a lot of work over the, my time in Rugby Bricks around sort of the seven brand pillars and your story is one of the biggest parts of it. it what changes people's perspective on your product. So that's what gives us a lot of power there. Behind the scenes, just to go back on your, on your rugby career, um, do you reckon there is much support uh, with professionals and then the, the next stage of, the, of their of their career? Did you have someone within in the Otago ranks or Northland ranks or, or whatever that was going, okay, this is, you know, it's time life to, after. You know, yeah, life, life after. after. What's going what's to happen with you? There, every team I've been in, there's been multiple, most years, or well, every year, maybe twice a year, people come in speaking about it. Whether you're wanting to listen at that time is the, <laughs> the difference. <laughs> and that's why I love the project thing. And that's where um, house advice is interesting because uh, if you think about before you buy a house, all those ads on TVs and loans and mortgage rates don't apply to you. You don't even hear that. You're tuned out. So um, I started Rugby Bricks because of one of those things, because other guys were starting little sock companies or um, T-shirt logos. And then based off that, I was like, okay, I'd love to try this. Um, So you do and then build from that. So, yeah, there's, there's plenty of support around. Yeah, there is. You just got to be open to it. Because you were you finished your career in, was it 2017? Yep. You must have been, what, 28, 29? 28, yeah, played one season over in Melbourne, and then, um, yeah, I was done. I was keen to get on to the next part. And and what? Yeah, what caused that? Well, yes. so what what was the reason for the retirement? I think going, going back to that Blues thing, like I'd put everything in. I, I was ready. Yep. And then... Um, we decided to, to head over to Melbourne and, and see something different. And I was just done. I'd given enough energy like to the the time that yep. training for rugby, gymming for rugby. Tra- sacrifice, eh? Hey? There's a lot of sacrifice that goes with it. Yeah, travelling for, for trainings and, and, all, and all that stuff. So I'd, I'd been there, done that. I'd done it all through those years at the academy, all through club rugby here in Dunedin. So I was like, you know what, I've, I've, I've ticked this box, it's time to get on with it. And Melbourne really opened both our eyes up to, wow, there's a world outside of, of rugby. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and see some different stuff. And yeah, it was a great decision and got my time back. It was magic. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Was there uh, one piece of advice from either a coach or someone in business that, that you... Um, always stick by it, stick by it or that was that was a bit of a life changing moment for you I th- not so much a coach a lot of social media guys have influenced me Gary V has been one yes. for, a, for a lot of people and I think he again does that green light thing for you in business or socials or um, that's probably been big there's definitely I reckon going back to my very first basketball coach he exposed me to um work ethic and enjoyment and obsessed and that's when I was like 12 years old 
Um, so I've always been encouraged by some people like that who just encourage you to, to love it and enjoy the craft. Do you think there's a... So some people are just self-driven and just, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I was born to do, that type of stuff. Um, and same thing, we'll go back to like Jenny, who we had on the last podcast. She went to the Olympic Games and she realised there that the only person that was holding herself back was herself because mm. she didn't believe. Yeah. When you make like changes and stuff, are you like really self-driven or does it take somebody like Kale, for example, because Reese is kind of mine for me. Mm. It's like, oh, why don't we just, in two months' time, this will be your full-time gig. It's like, yeah. I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Are you self-driven or is it kind of nice or are you nice to have somebody go, hey, man, there's the benchmark there? I like to have that person to encourage the behaviour. Um, yeah. I know that I can work hard. Like, if you tell me to go dig a hole, like, shit you, I'm up for that, let's go yeah. dig the hole. Yeah. But just that encouragement that the, the hole's a good idea to go dig and over there's a good spot and the dimensions and all that stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah. the it's, work. Sc- it's scary, right? Yeah. It's scary, you know? It's like, yeah, I kind of hear it and you even even with the rugby career and that sort of stuff, you know, with yeah. things that you wish you'd done, maybe taking a few more risks. Mm. Uh, Reese is that for me. Oh, yep. man, I'm, I'm okay down safe lane. It's kind of all good. It's what I know. It's how I do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what's, what flips you is when somebody goes, hey, what if we tried that? So, oh, I don't know, but I'll give it a go. And in this, like, position now as a coach, I always uh, acknowledge the weight of a coach's voice. Yeah. I was lucky enough to have Tony Brown for four years. And, man, Brownie would say one thing and I'd be thinking about that little cue or advice for like the next two weeks and then I'd tell my family about it and I'd tell my support crew and like there's so much weight in behind those people we look up to and mentors so um, yeah they, they've got a big part to play uh, once you let them in yeah can we talk about that the coaching <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. move on to the coaching yeah coaching uh, obviously you're, you're with um, the Super Rugby team Matatu what has that been like for you to, to get into that environment because I mean you're a busy man already you, you've got a, you've got a global company it's flourishing whatever you've got a family yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and now you and now you're taking up this role as an assistant coach for, for for the Super Rugby team how have you how have you managed to do all this yeah there's been a couple of director meetings and level tens missed I must admit <laughs> <laughs> um, but. It fulfills my cup and it fills my cup up and Rugby Ricks does benefit from me being busy as a coach and in and, um, and, and leading and learning. And so I'm bringing a lot, like I was at a Jersey presentation on Friday night and Foster comes and presents and speaks for 40 minutes on pressure and what he went through as a coach and all that mm. South African stuff and Razor was mm. going to come in. Like yeah. I'm only hearing and picking up that learning because I'm in that room. Yeah. And with that, Mick the kick, Mick Byrne was staying there with the Fiji and Drew, so we sat down for an hour and talked skills. And this is the world's best skills coach for the All Blacks. So those organic moments I'm aware of was putting myself there so that I can have them. Um, what did, was the question? Balancing. Did, yeah, did the opportunity to coach, it started in Aussie? Yes. When you were there? Yeah. Yeah, so did, I was... Did uh, that come from Rugby Bricks? or? It did actually. So a couple of people reached out um, from all different sports, but yeah, a few of the Wallaroos girls, like a Charlotte Keslick from the, the Sevens. So hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah there's the, the Storm Boys, a couple of them reached out, Wallabies like Matt Tamoa, all mm. came because of Rugby Bricks, and yeah, I was putting myself yeah. out there. And So you're telling me that all you have to do is just start a, start a <laughs> channel for a couple of years, just... Yeah throwing passes and it gets you a job with the Wallaroos. Yes, yeah, exactly, 100%. Um, that's how it came about. And then you turn up and you prove you are who you say you are yep. Yep. And, um, and then other opportunities come up. Do you sometimes yep. just sit there and go, like, what the, how the fuck have I managed to do this right now? Or just a pinch yourself sort of moment where you're sitting there like, you know, you're in Australia and you're, you're working with the Melbourne Storm. Mm. Like, this or, is because I yeah. started a rugby p- yeah. bridge page. Or, or does it feel like a progression? Yeah, so the answer to the first question is no. So Matthew McConaughey has a thing around being less impressed. Yeah. And you're not there to be a fan. So when I turn up to Toulouse in France, and I've got Anton Dupont and Thomas Ramos, like the best French boys in the world, 
the last thing they need is another dude, like a fan on the sideline, going, whoa, good job. Wow, oh, keep going. Like, they want a different opinion. They want a different coaching cue or a different challenge. Or mm. So, yeah, I'm, I am aware. I acknowledge what you're saying. Like, I am yes. aware of, um, you know, acknowledging uh, success and, and celebrating. But also, I'm not there to be a fan. Like, I'm there to – I actually love this stuff as a coach, and I want to, like – one of my things is building the best players in the world. Like that's what I love doing and love to do. So, yeah, being a little bit less impressed has has helped me along the way as well. Yeah. Right. So going back to my original question, how do you manage? Mm, yeah. All so many different things in your life. Yeah, I'm not managing it. And I said to KP, I was like, Kale, um, or I think I'm going to get shingles because I was just <laughs> stress levels. I I was doing too much. So in true KP fashion how can I help what can we reduce mm-hmm. what can we streamline what task can we take off your plate and going back to that mental guy that can help give direction he was able to say what have we got available how many hours is it 13 hours is it 20 hours is it 19 what can you allocate for us and how can we get the best ROI from that um, I struggle to prioritize the right task so yeah having someone around me like that is awesome and then I can add more value which then makes people happier so that's how I'm balancing it he's kind of like a um, he's kind of like a business mentor and life coach at the same time as long as you're managing managing director as well but he must be a very like obviously valued member and valued friend for you I think it's yeah um, from what I've heard so far he is just that person that you need in your corner sometimes to just show you here's the right way to go Yep, and we've got better at it together as well. Do you think that's Do you think that's the key for for a lot of people to find success is to to have someone that is your go to person to, to to push you to the next level or to think of a different way? It's why coaching is a profession, and it's why having and mentors is a thing, because I reckon we need such little boosts of self confidence. We need some. We we have to mm. find it somewhere and encouragement. And then from there, we can run with the baton, and then we get another little hit of it. Um, one awesome learning that I had recently was like, a, we in rugby, you've often got hard selection chat chats, and you gotta get through with that with people. And I definitely noticed my skill set was better from a lot of the chats that KP and I had had around business, and um, when we do need to you know, put our sides on the table and have a hard, frank conversation. We were able to do that and then move on. And the amount of times that we've had those hard convos on online and then KP's called two minutes later, bro, that was awesome. Thanks so much. Yep. Respect it. It's quite, quite interesting with uh, when the vision is clear. Yeah. Then it eliminates a lot of the personal, the personal type stuff. Yeah. Hey, I want to do this. Well, you can't do that. Yeah. Why are you telling me I can't do it? Because that's not the vision. Yeah. We're going this way, and you're slightly veering off. Reese and I have those conversations all the time. My mm. business partner, it's just like, oh, yeah. You're calling people on it, but you're not really. You're calling them on the vision that was decided yeah. for, and which is, we spend a lot of time doing. It's like, what? What's the whole point of this? Yeah. So I could assume that being very much the culture of teams, yeah. which therefore makes that process of, sorry, mate, you're not cutting the mustard, well, not this time. And. I definitely know that you're hard on the issue, gentle on the human. Yeah, yeah and yeah. that's it's just so obvious. They they can feel it. You know if you're delivering on that, like this move, we need this person running this line here at this timing. It's not about you as yeah. the human. Oh, but I can do it. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, this issue needs. This is the issue. I like you. Yeah. But this is the thing we need done, and it's so, it turns up all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so, no. oh, you. No, you don't. Mate, the, the, so the whole point of the podcast is the, the mindset and the mindset shifts. So from being a player to now being a coach, what's, what do you think are the biggest mindset shifts that you've had to make from transitioning from a player to a coach? And I'm assuming there's a lot of crossovers there that would by far make you a better coach if you have been a player in those experiences? Or Yeah, the IP and the understanding is, is valuable and that's why you see so many players get into coaching because there is all that IP. Like You can't go through a career with most teams, six coaches in the coaching team and not learn from a 14, 15 year career. Like There's so much that you see in that. I think my mindset shift has been more around the human 
I've had some great learnings about like if if the player understands their place, their people, their purpose, their tribe um, first, then when they come into the environment, they know who they are. We often hear like uh, everyone's got a voice in this team. Everyone can speak. Everyone can contribute. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to do those three things when you don't know who you are as a person. So as a coach and as a leader, if you can help unlock your people, like help your people understand what they're about, they can tr- contribute more in their own unique ways and you get way more out of them. How, how long does that take in a, in, in a team for, for someone to, you know, once you first start having those conversations, how long is it for that person to sort of get to that point where they're, they're unlocking a lot of that sort of stuff? It can happen quickly. We had a, um, a week together, Black Ferns XV, put a team together, and at the start of the week we had a whole heap of young women who were a bit unsure and very shy, and then by the end of it had done a lot of, it, it, it's, it's that start, it's that little bit of self-encouragement, right? Like they're not all the way through the journey, but we've, we've set them up. They actually had to build a thing, um, a kakahu, so we just helped them set them up around like, who are your people? Who is your place? What are your values? Um, bit of work in the diary, start that process off, and by the end of the week, sweet, I've got some framework I can build off. So it does happen pretty quick, actually. You just have to set them up for it. Isn't it interesting how it's got nothing to do with the sport? Yeah. It's got everything to do with understanding yourself. Yeah. It seems really interesting. Mate, have you had much to do with Wayne Smith on that? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Like a lot. Of, I've had Wayne on my podcast, um, one of my favourite chats. Oh, man, what a clever dude, eh? Yeah. What like a- to take our women's team from mm-hmm. hey, getting dusted over in, the, over in, uh, over in Europe <laughs> to coming through and, and taking out the final in this country. It's like in what, the span of like less than a yeah. year, maybe a year? Yeah, and that's that whole book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, I think the way that he can set a vision and then set all the little things up for success around that, like that was a masterclass from him. Yeah. Um, and some of the feedback on that campaign was unique, like nothing they'd ever seen before and experienced before and the confidence they had like their game plan was literally run everything we're not yeah. kicking it basically because yep. um, he ditched a lot of players too mm, yeah you know it's like oh man I don't know if you're doing the right thing here yes but. so cr- crystal clear vision um, which made him an, e- an easy leader to follow um, the job description was easy um, yeah. and then he got real good buy in from it as well so how do you, how do you learn uh, as a coach? How do you improve as a coach? Are you, are you following a lot of other coaches? Like we just said about Wayne Smith, but uh, Brownie, of course, as well. Like, is, are you talking to other coaches out there to, to get feedback and to, and to grow in your own way? I think, I like I mentioned before, I draw a lot of inspiration from a lot of different places. Um, listening, hearing. Being a skills coach, I have had a lot of spot coaching opportunities, so it's like a two, three week gig, so like at Toulouse, um, teams over in Japan, NRL, been to a couple of NRL clubs now. So with that, like, yep, you're there to deliver some kicking and catch pass skill set stuff, but you're in every team meeting, every yeah, coach's cool. meeting, every culture chat, like you're, you're seeing and hearing so many different things. Um, but I have had some good learnings lately. We, um, from New Zealand rugby, Craig Philpot came down. They mic you up. They film your coaching. It's pretty daunting. Mm. Um, I love being the rugby guy. Rugby yes. bricks guy mic'd up. <laughs> I know where he's on the control. <laughs> Whatever I say goes. But then when you have someone overhearing you. Yeah. And probably one thing I will share is I, I was doing a lot of commentating. Yeah, Phil, great job. Good lift. Nice. Awesome rep. So, so this was him assessing you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite, that's oh. scary. Yeah. yeah. So I was maybe saying the stuff you were doing well. So if you were um, doing a catch pass, awesome early catch, well done, hands clean, point yeah. to target. But that's just commentating. Whereas I need to increase my pulling. Phil, when you caught that well, why is that going to help you with your pass? Yeah, far out. And, and pulling from players. So that was a cool learning. So there's... Yeah. Um, and because I'm super open to it, um, yeah, I can pick stuff up and run with that. Like I, that, I found myself pulling that afternoon. Like, yeah, yeah, I think that's a key, eh? Because mm. the old ego st- sort of starts to jump <laughs> yeah. out. Like, what does this guy know? <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, to switch that to go, okay, cool, I've heard it. Do I do it? Like for me personally, it's yeah. like, I've heard that. Do I do it? 
stuff you I don't. Yeah. Two days later, I was like, yeah, actually, I do. Yeah. And I go, cool, yeah, no, I've got it. Yeah, yeah, I need to shift it. And this goes back to KP, the first time he used to <laughs> challenge me, like, five years ago. Come on. <laughs> yeah, <pretty much. laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. And then you learn that he's not coming at you. He's coming at you on the issue, and yep. he's probably right. Yep. Give it a crack. Listen. Yep. Learn. Um, yeah, so yeah, opportunities like that, there's, those are everywhere. Um, and I think we, because we have an Outwork Out Learn meeting on a Monday where everyone turns up and present what they've been learning. Oh, cool. And um, it's always good. Everyone's always got a five minute slot where they just present on. Is that just with the management? Uh, with rug, the rig team, oh, Rugby Bricks team. Yep, yep. Um, so you always hear stuff there. And literally, with that, it creates a learning environment inside your team. Like we are learning people. And um, I suppose it helps switch your mindset and learn, learn, keep learning. Mm. Um, been really helpful. So you, you've come into the coaching role this year. What, is, what has it been like um, your first season with, with the side? We've lost our first three games, so we're under the pump. But uh, the learning from there is most things you go through, why do you coach? That's the question that you often have to fill out on the form when you go to a coaching seminar and what's your purpose? And all those things don't change based on a win and a loss. So therefore, why is it changing you when you're turning up on the daily and on, in every hour? So that's been a good reminder is that even though things aren't going to plan, it doesn't mean get tight, frustrated and change you and your why. Lean into your why. Like if one of your things is to build players and build people, then what's stopping you now? Like why is a loss stopping you? Um, makes you check things, it makes you accountable, more questions come up when you lose, winning solves all problems. <laughs> um, makes things easier, right? But one of my things for a coach this year was to get really organised with my um, video, with my scouting of teams, with um, reviewing oppositions, um, putting together a great game plan, so that's, um, that's something I'm trying to just nail every week, doesn't matter who we're playing or what the results, I want to be really strong there. Going back on the results side where you've lost three in a row, the team was was you know the defending champs, mm. um, so I can imagine that's been pretty hard for a lot of those players that have that were in the setup last year. Going, you know, we we've got this. Did they come in with any sort of ego into this sort of season, or is it just something that just hasn't been clicking? Yeah, it's that momentum thing. So, uh, and one thing you mentioned about being a past player, like you've, I've had losing seasons, I've had winning seasons, and when you don't have momentum and you're not just humming and clicking and that, that bounce of the ball, as they always say, is going your way, that, that's sometimes all it is. Like we just don't, and we haven't managed to get any momentum yet this year, um, and we can still get it, we can still chase some, but it's not like we're losing by 50 and it's a complete like we're in every game we're generally losing by about a try um, it's just a, a little things that just aren't adding up for us at the moment and it's a it's a longer season this season isn't it yeah so it's, they've put a whole another round onto it this year so last year it was short and sharp this year it's six games and then straight into final um, but what a what a product for the Black Ferns coaches to watch it's pretty like awesome four wicked teams Black Ferns everywhere Talent. The games are, the games are intense. So for play, like I reckon rugby players' IQ through this is just going to go through the roof mm. because maps are changing, moves are changing every week, defences are different. Like it's yeah, it's wicked. To, going back to that momentum thing, is that where as a coach you kind of lean a little bit more towards the the leadership team in it or the the more experienced players? Yeah. To to kind of go hey, is it drop in momentum how do we switch that yep. in those in those moments because for me um, Richie McCall was that yeah. you know when we needed it it would always happen that's why we were so successful yeah. because whatever it is if you had to stop and talk to the referee for a little bit or remind the referee about something or give away a penalty or whatever it was or slow the game down mm. he had that intelligence to kind of go mm, the momentum we need to shift it yeah. or we need to stop it so we talk about stacking momentum so when you're in a code window, so when you're doing your review, um, say there's, there's 12 starter plays, and you, the first one might be green because it's successful, then you might get a red because you might knock it on, and if you follow that up with another red with an error and another red, you've gone green, red, red, red. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, as a leader, you can go, okay, sweet, we've lost a bit of that momentum, the team's off. 
we use a thing called blue water and white water when it comes to like the like rafting analogy so let's get back to blue water and just get calm make some decisions that a blue water play would look like and then once you've got back into those green green start to load it up then white water let's go like but you've got to sort of earn that and feel that a little bit so stacking momentum is pretty important in teams and the best teams like you're saying with Richie we've lost it let's um let's try shift it yeah golfers are good at that Mm. that's why golf's probably uh, quite a cool sport you know it's like the top players have a bad hole get over it very very quickly yeah come back with the birdie yeah, hundred percent. Every shot, yeah, just yeah. that reset, little processes. Um, yeah. Goal yeah. kicking. So, I've really leaned into golf more recently with how similar it is. Yeah, it's a thing, eh? Yeah. So when I was kicking and didn't play golf, I was like, it's not even close. It's not the same thing. But now I've completely shifted. Yeah. It is so similar. Yeah. The other thing with golf is you have so much time to think about mm. what if it's going wrong or what if it's going right. Yeah. For it to then switch very very quickly or not. Yeah. Or not. Agree. Going, going back to um, women's rugby and, and the game now, obviously the Black Ferns won in 2022. Two. Yeah, 22. They won the World Cup, and now there's this is the third this is the third season of of Super Rugby for the women. Yep. Um, where do you think the competition in women's rugby is going to go over the next five years? Because I think women in sport in general, there's definitely a lot of um, development in it. Um, I know working in the cricket scene as well that um, you know, New Zealand cricket are, are focusing big time on um, on the women's game. So yeah, where, where do you think it's going to land in the next three, four, five years time? It's going to keep building and NRLW is a big beast having seen that and dealt with a lot of the players over there. So New Zealand rugby is going to have to keep up with that otherwise. I mean Stacey Walker's yeah, just... What's the, saw that. So yes. what's the cash comparison? It's big. Yeah, so one of the right. smartest things the NRLW did is every club has two players that don't fall into the salary cap. Oh. So therefore you got how many teams? I think there's 12 teams. So there's 24 girls of the best of the best. Stacey Walker's yep. probably a Porsche. Like your yeah, Tyler Nathan Wong or Millie Boyle's yes. like your your best can now get secured for big. And that's like 110, 120K for, for that wow. sort of contract. Yep. So therefore, that's going to put some pressure back on us to retain well, players. Well, a lot of the girls, are, a lot of the girls are slapping together a 12-month year. So they'll go Super Rugby Opiki. They might play some um, more. Go head over to England, play for Saracens, come back, do something in Australia. Like they're just make shifting a year together. So the quicker that we can get to those more of those sort of 12 month or extended contracts, secure talent, keep them here. Yeah. Um, they're just going to have to, otherwise. They're all going to go. Um, mate, the, the FIFA World Cup, during the FIFA World Cup, there was, I just want to talk about injuries for a little bit, because do you see in women's sport, because this is kind of all, it's all new ground now, mm. right? They've, you know, this is a pathway for kids now to, holy shots, well, yeah. I'm pretty good at running with a ball and that sort of stuff, actually can make a living out of it, actually could make a pretty good living out of it, Sure. Um, which is essentially what people chase, or, 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 or more than likely chase, that's, yep. that's the carrot. The flip side of that is the injuries that go with that. Do you see any, like, are there bad injuries that are happening or consistent injuries that are always seem to be in the forwards for, for the girls for the in the backs? I reckon that we are well across that. Yeah, like, having okay. been in quite a few environments lately, that we are protecting players so well now, running, loading, um, the stuff that they have to tick off before they can return to full training, et cetera, et cetera. Like, there's actually not as many injuries in the women's game as the men's game. Yeah. had a good chat with our physio last week on this. Like, during a season, and all the squads at the moment don't really have injury issues yeah. compared to the boys' side. So yeah. um, it's probably that next tier down of when you're coming through, you're a teenager, like that crazy week that we all know that academies and high performers and school pressure and first 15 players, like... That, I reckon, is the high-risk area yeah. because they're actually looking after the athletes super well once they actually get to like a Mata 2 team. Yeah. That was very cool. Um, looking at your coaching career, where, I mean, you've been a player, now you've you, you founded a business, a global business, and now you've gone back into to coaching. What is your goal? What are you wanting to achieve next? Is it, is it something down the, the coaching path? Do you want to be... 
encouraged you want to yeah <laughs> it's funny. mind you that sounds like it would be a, a hard conversation with uh, <laughs> with KP um, definitely clear goals inside of Rugby like we want to build um, a big global brand um, and that's we sort of made this deal after the last Rugby World Cup that we we're going to go hard and through to the next one and then evaluate where we're at so we're fully committed to that and I was lucky enough to get this much to do thing across the line. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we are fully committed to that. So my next decision sort of around coaching needs to um, work with them. Account, needs for that. To account for that. With that, like I, I definitely want to sort of push the boat out and try to be the best kicking coach in the world. Like that is one thing that I, I'm working towards. How that comes together, I'm not sure. But I, I like that goal better than saying oh, black head coach because there's so many uncontrollables. You've got to um, prove yourself a lot to get to that one. So that's kind of where I'm heading with it all. Mm. Oh, that's cool. It's, it's interesting to sort of hear that, um, to be the greatest kicking coach yeah. in, in the world. And the reason why that is a good thing is because, like, Jace Ryan with the scrum coach, if he didn't say he wanted to be the best scrum coach, then he won't lean towards an opportunity to go to the ballerina academy and learn how they use their big toe for pushing off yep. so that's why I'm so happy saying it is because by saying that then opportunities like if there's an NFL kicking person in New Zealand for some reason yeah sweet that aligns with that and mm. it's like so my message there is the North Star doesn't have to be um, too the massive biggest, the or, brightest star yeah the brightest star but it, it make it specific because then things can apply to it um, and you can make decisions based off it. And if you yeah, did actually cool, want to yeah. be a, a, a head coach, you'd have to probably coach the Highlanders to mm. about five Super Rugby titles <laughs> yeah. in a row. To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Landers, they're looking good this year. <laughs> they are Jamie looking good. Joe's back in the yeah, house. He is. He's a um, bit of steel. Well, I've, I, just, I heard that, um, that they've, uh, well, I know a couple of their players, or you know, Billy, you know, didn't start that game in the Waratahs because they were late and it was kind of, right, this, yeah, is his new, right. this is his new um, mm. thing coming in and, and um, yeah, laying down the wall. Do you reckon they'll go well this year? Um, they've got a playoff chance, you reckon? I reckon they've got a playoff chance, but I'm loving the early signs of their culture's spot better, on right? at the moment. Yes. Yeah, you you yeah. can just tell by how they're holding themselves and um, those little effort areas that they're just absolutely nailing. So um, I think Jamie and Brownie did a great job of identifying... They knew exactly who they were last when they won it, 15. Yes. And I think they're getting back to that, like exactly who they are under the roof and um, how they play. Actually, um, side note, just on, on rugby in New Zealand in general, like where do you see the sport at? And, and, and mm. obviously there's a lot of issues involved with the game. It's a lot slower. The product, um, I mean, I'm always centered on social media right now. The, the product isn't as good as the NRL and the NRL has got a faster you know, product, whatever. So I guess, yeah, your thoughts on that, being in that environment, where do you see the game's at at the moment and where do you think the game needs to go to get to maybe where it was 10, 10 15 years ago? I think the game's sweet. When you look at the Six Nations, like they know, like Six Nations knows exactly what it is. The fans know what it is. When you turn up each year, you know what it is, and you know what the games are in one, two, three, or five years' times. And a lot of their stadiums are, are, are sold out. Yeah. Every single game yep. is pretty much sold out. So the product knows what it is. NRL, the product knows what it is. The Roosters have been the Roosters for years and years and years. Um, same with all those clubs. I think the thing that's happening with Super Rugby at the moment um, is we don't really know what the product is. Yeah. and how that looks moving forward and whether we're going to get an Argentina team come in or a yeah. Japan team or the, um, the island teams, Moana Pacifica, like what is happening with our comp? It's constantly changing, which when it comes to like that tribalism thing, it, we just are struggling a bit, bit clunky, so we're a bit lost. Um, the game's sweet. There's no issue with rugby. Do you, we, think, do you think so that South Africa moving out of, of Super Rugby yeah. was, was, was it? Was the... Yeah, Why did you do that? That was a huge the loss. Credibility's gone up. Well, not yeah. I guess mm. you want to compete against the best. Yeah. You know, when you're not, it's like, well, then what do we got? And we've got a team in South Africa, Rugby Rick ZA, who do a great job. Three guys over there, and that is a huge market. Like yeah. the, the rugby mm. schoolboy stuff is yes. incredible. 
So they're loving it because now they're having hard games against all those um, pro UK teams, mm. like your big Harlequins and Saracens. Like mm. their derbies are, are huge. Mm. So they're loving it. They're benefiting from it. They're, the Springboks are benefiting from it. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, that was definitely a loss for us. So I think as soon as we understand exactly who we are and lock in more of a longer term plan, um, that'll definitely help. Mm. Interesting. No, it's interesting to hear people's thoughts on it just because I think it's just a hot, hot topic in every single year and it's ongoing throughout the season as well. I've seen it on social media, I see you know, all these pages talking about and a lot of people commenting that you know, Super Rugby just isn't there without having South Africa and what are they going to do next? They're going to add an Argentinian team and they're going to get the Sunwolves back in, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So, and you're probably right that there is no identity there. We tribalism all that sort of stuff there there's a few key factors there that um, that they're missing yeah the Aussie, Aussies have been bagged a little bit over the last few years but I reckon there's the opportunity there directly with them um, they're getting better and some of the people in Aussie just knowing a few of them like it's it'd be so cool to see those derbies again and yeah. just make it a little bit more predictable for us as a fan like we just know exactly <laughs> who we're playing Aussie versus New Zealand there's an opportunity there I reckon is there a, a so living over there, coaching over there, what's the, mi- what's the difference in mindset from rugby here to rugby over there? Well, even just playing club rugby. So I played in a club called Harlequins and I found the game quite clunky. Like we underestimate how flowy and, and silky it we is are. here. Yeah, yep. it is here. And that's from playing touch rugby every lunchtime yep. and everyone having a ball in their hands. So... That was different, and then who plays over there is really different. It did like it is, it is private boys' schools yep. over there, so that brings a different person into the into the team, um, and they they feel like the poor brother yep. under the NRL, especially living in Sydney yep. um, and Melbourne as well with the Storm. Yep. Um, seeing the Rebels and the Storm use the exact same field is you can see it the, mm. the difference in, in how they conduct themselves. But I also think that's where the opportunity is. Yeah, yeah, they're a big underdog, too. Eh? They love, love that kind of tag yeah. and, and buy into it. And they're it in it for the long, for it, long I think. run. Yeah. There's some wicked people over there in rugby. Yeah. And, um, yeah, well, they just employed Joe Schmidt, didn't they, yes. as, the, as, the, as the head coach? Yeah. And I think the Rebels maybe going under, under is probably going to be a good thing. Um, get those four teams Just strong. Tighten it up. Yeah, yeah tighten it up. Yeah. Get more talent in those four yeah. teams, which is what we're seeing with Opiki right now for yeah. us. Man, the teams are stacked. Yeah. And for a spectator, you're seeing black ferns on both sides, both teams. It's predictable. You know what's coming. The yeah. games are awesome. Mm. Yeah. No, that's cool. Um, before we wrap up, sort of outside of your professional game and, and, and business that, you know, young family, so how, how are you sort of juggling everything you've got on right now <laughs> with, 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 with the young family also? Nappy changes. <laughs> My wife Jay's doing a fantastic job. There we go, props to Jay. <laughs> Mia, when Mia turned up, we were in lockdown and COVID, so we had the best experience ever. Six months with a baby girl, so fun. And your first is, is different. You're so hyper on yeah. everything. Your, your skill set, as they call it, isn't, isn't up to scratch. <laughs> and we actually, when we left with Junior, so my boy now, eight months, the midwife said, you'll be amazed with your skill set that you've got. And yeah. this one will feel so different. And she was spot on. Within an hour, we knew what to do. Yeah. Like, seen this before. Yeah. It will stop crying. <laughs> 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 um, so those sort of things. But yeah, everyone always says it's the best thing ever, and it is. It's it's incredible, and, yeah. and we're loving it. Our families are loving it. Mum, Dad, it's pretty cool seeing your parents engage with your kids, mm. and um, and they teach you so much. So I'm, I'm absolutely loving it. It is hard. Like it's when I spend time away with coaching, I definitely get a bit of homesick and, and miss them. Because um, you're travelling quite a bit up to Christchurch for, yeah. for, for, for the matches and, and yep. whatnot. And even I spent a bit of time away with Georgia, the country, and that was a good six week stint um, over in the European Championship. And that was hard. You, you miss them. And I think. One thing my father's always been awesome at is like you've got to you've got to chase. As soon as you stop chasing, you sort of lose who you are. So I'm always aware like we've got to you sort of teach your kids how to how to live by living. Yep. And I've definitely been aware of that. So I'm going to keep keep chasing and living, awesome. um, and hopefully that rubs off on them a little bit. Yeah, and oh, that's cool. Very cool. Mm-hmm. 
Mate, thanks so much. I know it's a, it's a happy birthday today. Yeah, thank hey. you. Yeah. Thanks happy so much. Happy birthday. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for giving out your time to be with us. 29. 29, no. is it? 29. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's awesome. It's, it's great to have you on the podcast. Um, all the best for the rest of the, the Super Rugby uh, season for, for you and the uh, month or two. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing um, how they go and, and obviously Rugby Bricks and seeing that expand into the, the global force yes. that it is at the moment. We'll have to probably get you back on at Absolutely. some point. Absolutely, that would be cool. Yep. Yeah, no, no thank you very, very much for jumping on the show. Is Kale in the pipeline to chat to? I think you'd be... He was our dummy run, eh? We, no, you had a dummy run. Yeah, and he gave us some feedback on how, <laughs> how, <laughs> shit, how <laughs> shit it was. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 I won't do that again. Yeah, <laughs> so good. No, it would be good to sort of have him, I think, jump on again. I think I didn't see um, yep. he's, he's definitely got a fascinating story around the, you know, where he's come from and yeah. TikTok and obviously Rappy Bricks. No, thanks so much. I... Um, it's really cool to see some Dunedin faces and, and yeah. this crew doing this and uh, podcasts is such a it's almost like that campfire thing right yes, man. we all sit around and learn yeah. and listen so um, keep up the great work thanks so much for the opportunity no, awesome thank you cheers man